over to Palolo Points. I'm Brandon Strange of Sports Map Houston. That's Charlie Palolo of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. It's the Charlie Palolo Show, which you can catch every weekday, 10 a.m. to noon, or anytime on podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, Charlie, welcome in. There was probably a coin flips chance of, you know, how we were going to be talking about the Texans this morning. There was big questions of how would this team compete? Ken Hoffman wrote uh, an article for SportsMapHouston.com last week talking about the importance of week one and how they could get some buy-in from the fans, you know, not by delusion that they would be a contender, but that, you know, how well would this team really compete? And they did not look like the worst team in the AFC South. They actually looked like a team that was convincingly beating the worst team in the division. So let's talk about some areas that the Texans can build on to keep that mojo going. Um, first one is coaching and preparedness. What did you see from the Texans this week that they can build on in week two? Well, it was such a stark contrast to the Jaguars, who obviously had the higher profile rookie head coach in Urban Meyer and the uh, star new quarterback in Trevor Lawrence relative to veteran journeyman quarterback to Rod Taylor. It's Jacksonville that looked like it convened maybe 20 minutes before the game and put some plays in and said, here's how many guys you have to have in the huddle and how you have to get a playoff before the clock runs down to zero. Uh, the Texans look pretty clean uh, all in all. Uh, but we really do need to grade it on the curve, right? The Jaguars are horrific. They won opening day last year, and now their losing streak is at 16. So I don't think it's any great breakthrough that, whoa, the Texans are a lot better than we all thought that they would be. And they go show well in Cleveland Sunday. On the one hand, it'll be, hey, you know, this is impressive. They're playing hard. There is a sense of rowing the boat the same way, as opposed to last year when Bill O'Brien lost the squad very early in the 0-4 start. Uh, then again, will it be, what are you doing? Stop winning games unless you're going to win nine or ten of them and be in the playoffs and screwing around with that super high draft pick. Um, but, you know, I would say uh, savor a life moment for the players themselves. David Culley, 65 years old, never even been a coordinator before, much less a head coach to get the opportunities. So it's that one moment in time you can never take away the bell that can't be unrung. But I'm not going to thrust the Texans into the cauldron of mediocrity just yet. They're still at the bottom of the vat or near the bottom of the vat. They're certainly ahead of the Jags. Well, a couple, another uh, point that I think they have to build off of was Tyrod Taylor as a game manager. Obviously, he'll face a much better defense against Cleveland next week. But what did you see out of Tyrod that he could build on? Well, through his career where he's been thought of as a really good backup and a placeholding starter who's competent, starting with the guy doesn't do stupid stuff. And Trevor Lawrence will learn. I mean, he's a greenhorn rookie, but three interceptions, you're going to lose most of the time where you throw three interceptions in a game. Uh, Terod Taylor has always been a protector of the football, which should, I guess, limit some of your downside while also holding down some of your upside. Uh, Brandon Cooks is a legit top 15-ish wide receiver. Right? Wherever, wherever he's been, he keeps hanging 1,000-yard seasons on the wall. Um, to me, he's really their only offensive playmaker. So if they can creatively find ways to get him the ball, uh, Farrell Brown actually, I think, has some interesting upside as a tight end. Right, the Texans at different points in their history seem to have had a fetish where they drafted tight end after tight end after tight end. Kahali Waring was a total bust who they cut this year. Uh, Farrell Brown made a few plays in limited opportunities last year and showed well Sunday against the Jaguars. Uh, the offensive line, I wouldn't say was a fortress of protection for Terod Taylor, but as they're moving new pieces in, uh, it wasn't a jailbreak against the Jacksonville team that does have at least one good pass rusher in Josh Allen, but you're stepping it up facing Miles Garrett on the road against a team that probably will score some points. So uh, they'll deal with adversity for the first time, right? They were total front runners up 13, 14, nothing, six minutes into the game. Um, so I expect the Seas to overall still be stormy. But they're not the Titanic heading for 0-17. We know that much. And for as much as a bad record and high draft picks would be good, right? since they seem to have built a collection of legitimate role-playing professionals, it would not be right for them or a suffering fan base to have to deal with a season-long morbidity watch of, are they ever going to win one? Are they ever going to win one? Maybe the Jaguars can deal with that. You mentioned Miles Garrett. They'll also see a familiar face in Javian Clowney. And not to mention that Cleveland will be especially familiar with Tyrod Taylor given his time there. The third thing that kind of sticks out to me as a, as a point to build on going into week two is Lovey Smith's defense. Uh, the Texans only got 
three interceptions all last year. We saw them equal that in the first game. Um, we saw Lovey's defense perform and get turnovers in the preseason. It carried over into game one. How can they build on that going into game two? Yeah, at what point does, well, once is an occurrence, maybe twice is a coincidence, or maybe, hey, there's something going on here. Uh, Trevor Lawrence is a rookie quarterback. He's going to throw probably a good number of picks. Damn sure if they're going to have him throw 50 passes per game. Right? Peyton Manning led the world. He threw 28 interceptions his rookie year. Of course, he figured it out. Uh, but cover two, what it's supposed to do is limit the big plays. And if they can identify a playmaker or two on this defense, because coming into the season, right, Justin Reed, who gets dinged up and you're thinking, no, oh, no, but it was okay after that. Uh, in the post-J.J. Watt era, uh, moving on from Bradley Roby, their best corner last season when he was legally allowed to play anyway, where can they make some plays? Um, I still think over the the long haul, they're going to get torn up unless they can really sustain some pass rush against competent offenses. But at least it gave them a little scintilla of hope that uh, it might not just be one beat down after another this season. And then uh, the last point was the running game. Mark Ingram, Philip Lindsay, even David Johnson at times looked for improvement from last year. What did you see out of the running game that they could build on? I do like that Tim Kelly seems to have identified roles. They're not going to try to continue to force square peg into a round hole or round peg into square hole with David Johnson. Justify the trade, justify the trade. When he was ineffective as a running back last year, he's cast as their third down pass catching back now. Uh, it was just one game, but maybe Mark Ingram is going to be the heavier duty back. Now, with Ingram, you get no explosive plays. I think his long run was six, but if you're continuing to get three, four, three, four, so you're in second and six, manageable type situations, third and three, third and four, instead of a lot of second and nines or third and eights. Uh, Ingram didn't average three and a half yards per carry, but they were able to control some clock, uh, not be one-dimensional offensively, but still outside of Cook's. You know, who are the guys who can break off the occasional chunk plays? Because unless you're facing teams that really are terrible, it's tough to make a living with multiple 75, 80-yard touchdown drives per game. I think one of the things you touched on that's really, really interesting there is uh, defining roles for these players and putting them in places to succeed. Uh, we saw the, the long pass exclusively go to Brandon Cooks. Uh, we saw uh, Danny Amendola only on the field around a dozen times, but yet caught five passes. So I, I really do feel like it goes into that preparedness uh, you know, category of they've defined these roles and they're going to use these guys to, that set them up for success and kind of optimize them when they're on the field. Now, the, the difference is they played a team that are not contenders. The Browns are contenders, and they definitely will not overlook a team that just dropped 37 on a division rival. So what will we find out about the Texans after they've played Cleveland in week two? What will we know if, about them? If they're in a game in the fourth quarter, that would be very impressive. And you still don't want to overreact to two games, but the Browns are good. As a playoff team from last year, that's probably thought of as a, a second tier, but a second tier Super Bowl threat in the AFC, kind of depending on where you are on Baker Mayfield as a quarterback. But they're going to get a focused Browns team, right? It's Cleveland's home opener. The Browns gave up a lead or could have had a real signature early win at Kansas City. So the Browns shouldn't be flat. They shouldn't be looking ahead. So it's a tough environment. Uh, Browns are favored by 12 as a combination of all that. Uh, I guess one thing, you know, in terms of looking down the line with Nick Casario's vision for how he hopes to build this team. I think a signature over the years with the Patriots and Casario working in lockstep, lockstep with Belichick, they were always trying to improve the roster from the bottom up as well as the top down. So your special teamers, and if you need to have a second stringer in or you want to rotate in defensive linemen, that you have fewer guys on your roster who really don't belong on a legitimate NFL roster. So week to week, I'll be interested in seeing what sort of transactions uh, Casario has in mind because he figures to be, I think, very active. That was something the Patriots, the last two, three guys in their roster, ever, am I going to be on a team or am I going to be on the practice squad? Am I going to get cut? Uh, they're biding their time until they can get the real haymaking bell weather signature talent ideally starting in free agency and with some high draft picks and high round draft picks in 2022. 